singing tonight. And uh, amen, you can say amen right there. Uh, that's scriptural singing. That's Bible singing. And, uh, and I appreciate that. And uh, what a joy it is to be back in the house of the Lord this evening. And uh, I've just uh, I rejoiced all day. And I appreciate what the Lord did in our hearts this morning. And, uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, what he's going to do tonight. And uh, good to hear about those that uh, those that's uh, getting saved and, and uh, getting baptized and following the Lord and serving the Lord. That's always uh, encouraging to me. And uh, I want to say this. It's also encouraging to me when I look up in your choir and you got all these young people. And uh, you look out and you got all these uh, young people, uh, you know, in church. And, and uh, that's encouraging to me. Sometimes I get discouraged. I go to these places and, uh, you know, I'm uh, far the youngest one there. And, uh, you know, there's nobody, no kids. And uh, that, that concerns me uh, because I'm telling you, uh, if we don't reach this next generation, we're in trouble. And, uh, and so I, I, it's good to see young people uh, in a church like this sitting under preaching uh, that goes on here on a weekly basis. And I thank the Lord for it. And uh, uh, you young people ought to thank God, too, uh, that you're in a good place. And, and I appreciate that. I want you to take your Bibles tonight and be finding the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 18. Jeremiah, uh, chapter number 18. And a very familiar uh, text tonight. I'll give you the thought the Lord has laid upon my heart. Jeremiah, chapter number 18. Jeremiah chapter number 18 and verse number 1. Jeremiah chapter number 18 and verse number 1. If you love your Bible this evening, would you let it know by saying amen? amen? The Bible says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel. It seemed good to the potter to make it. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. I want to preach on the potter and the clay this evening, God being my helper. And, uh, and let's ask God to help us as we come to the preaching time. Father, we do love you. Lord, I thank you for thy word. Thank you for thy truth. Thank you for the infallible and errant word of God. I'm glad, Father, what we have before us tonight. God, it's not just some myth. It's not a, just an idea. It's not just something that man came up with one day. Uh, but, God, we have something that's sure, something that's absolute and certain, and something we can uh, rest upon this evening, and I'm forever grateful for that. And I come as, a, uh, as a, uh, an unable and incapable uh, servant of thee, Lord, to do what you've called me to do. But, God, you've called me, and so now I ask of thee, Spirit of God, Lord, help me to do what you've called me to do. I pray you breathe on me one more time. I pray for a fresh touch and a fresh anointing and an unction to preach with. Uh, Lord, it's my I desire to lift you up tonight. Lord, may we exalt uh, the name of Jesus. And for that one that may be among us tonight, Lord, that uh, whatever needs represented, that one that needs to come and, uh, and to draw closer unto you, whatever uh, needs to be done, I pray that they would do that. Uh, if there's here anyone here tonight that's lost, I pray, God, they don't leave the same way they came. Uh, but I pray they'd place their faith in you and be forever changed for it's everlasting too late. Lord, we love you and we thank you ahead of time for what you're about to do. It's in Jesus Christ's high and holy name I do humbly pray. Pray, amen, and amen. Thank you so much for standing. You can be seated this evening. Jeremiah the prophet, uh, in my opinion, is one of the greatest men of God that, that God ever uh, raised up. Uh, he was a man that was called to uh, prophesy in a day, to preach in a day when really nobody wanted any preaching. Nobody wanted to hear what God had to say. Uh, nobody was interested in what uh, Jehovah had to say. Uh, but yet we find for 40 plus years this man of God, he stood faithful and he stood tall and he preached forth the word of God, what God had put in his heart. Uh, yet nobody came. 
cared. Nobody listened. Nobody got right. Nobody got saved. Never uh, do we find this man. Never is he building buildings. Never is he building a congregation. I mean, nobody's ever coming up to the man of God and giving him a pat on the back saying, a preacher, we sure do appreciate you. A preacher, we appreciate your stand. We appreciate your faithfulness to God. Uh, Jeremiah never experienced any of that, yet he was still uh, faithful to preach the word of God. Uh, may I say that uh, if, if ever there was a day we need some men of God to stand up and be faithful uh, to the word of God, it is this day and this hour. Uh, many times I feel like we as preachers in 2021, uh, a lot of times I feel like we get discouraged when you look around and you think, man, uh, nobody wants to hear what God says anymore. Nobody wants preaching. Nobody wants, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Holy Ghost anymore. I mean, it's kind of the uh, generation now we're looking more for motivational speaking and uh, we're looking more for a pep talk rather uh, than a preacher. And I want to say this, if you got a man of God, which you do, uh, you ought to thank the God of heaven that somebody, uh, God's put a man over you that loves you enough to tell you the truth even uh, when you don't want to hear it, even when it may not make you feel right. Uh, still yet he's faithful uh, to preach the word of God. Uh, but we are living in a day where there's uh, uh, more interested in the things of this world. That's why when you look around on a Sunday, uh, you'll find stadiums filled with people. You can find gymnasiums filled with people and yet it seems as though our pews are still empty, uh, parking lots are empty, uh, doors are, are still uh, barren inside the house of God. Uh, you say, why is that preacher? Here's why. Because we're living in a world uh, that cares, that, that has no care as to what God has to say about it. Uh, but I want to say, man of God, I continue to mount your post. I just rear back and preach it again. I just continue to thunder forth the word of God. It's not in vain. God's still doing a word. And as ever there was a day we needed some men to be faithful to the preaching of the word of God, it is in this day and it is in this hour. Jeremiah was that kind of man. He was faithful to the word of God. He's known as the weeping prophet. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you take your Bible and turn it over a few more chapters, you'll run into the, uh, to the book of Lamentations. After he writes the book of Jeremiah, he writes four more chapters, and that is known as the, as the book of Lamentations. And it's there uh, where we find the man of God. He's brokenhearted. I mean, he's sorrowful. He's crying. He is lamenting over the condition of the people of God. I read the book of Lamentations. I think to myself, I said, well, if I had to preach to that crowd uh, throughout my ministry, I'd probably be lamenting too. I'd probably be crying too. But Jeremiah was faithful uh, to preach the word of God. However, if you've ever studied the life and ministry of Jeremiah, uh, you know that Jeremiah was a great illustrative preacher. I mean, many times throughout the book of Jeremiah, you'll find to where God would uh, give him illustrations and uh, Jeremiah would use these illustrations to uh, illustrate the message of which God uh, was wanting him to relay to the people. At one occasion, you'll find Jeremiah walking down Main Street and he's got a yoke around his neck and he's telling uh, the people of God, he's preaching the message that if you don't get right with God, uh, God's going to put a yoke on your neck. And we find another occasion, he'll take a bottle and he'll break that bottle and he'll stand before the congregation and he'll stand before the people of God and he'll say that if, if you don't get your heart right with God, you don't serve God, that uh, this is what God's going to do to you. I, I mean, what kind of message would that be? That'd be a good message. I mean, you imagine your preacher getting up and breaking that bottle saying, that's what God's going to do to you uh, if you don't get right. And many other illustrations you'll find Jeremiah would use throughout his ministry. However, uh, most all suggest and all agree that the most popular uh, illustration that he would ever use is here uh, in our text tonight. It is the illustration in that of the potter and the clay. The potter and the clay. If you've been in church for any amount of time, no doubt you've uh, uh, come across this. You've heard it preached from. Uh, there's been a, many a sermons preached from, uh, from this text, Jeremiah chapter 18. There's been a many a songs that have been written uh, from Jeremiah chapter number 18. Uh, many songs have been sung. Many lessons have been taught. Uh, many messages have been preached. And we could spend all night long going over uh, the different points and the different truths that God has revealed to his men down through time uh, uh, using the illustration of the potter and the clay. I'll highlight just a few of them and then I'll give you the thought the Lord's put in my heart and I pray 
uh, that it'll be a help and a blessing uh, to you as well this evening. Now when you look at this illustration, what you find is you'll find there's a potter and you find the clay. And we know and understand that the potter is that which represents God the Father. I believe that's pretty clear. And then the clay is that which represents man. Or here in its context, the nation of Israel. Now if you're a Bible studier, you'll know that uh, there are times where God likens men in that to clay or in that to, uh, to the dust of the ground. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that, uh, that God took man and he formed man uh, from the clay of the ground, from the dust of the ground. Uh, man did not evolve from a monkey. Amen, amen, and amen. Uh, you say, preacher, I don't know if I agree with that or not. That's not what my science book says. That's not what my science teacher says. I want to say your science book is wrong and the Bible's right. Amen. Uh, you didn't evolve from a monkey and then developed into whatever it is you look in when you get up and look in the mirror of a morning. No, uh, you were uniquely made. You were supernaturally made. Uh, by the way, uh, you didn't get to choose what gender you are. Say amen right there. Uh, God chose it for you. Uh, he alone formed you and the Bible says that he took uh, from the dust of the ground he formed man and he breathed into the nostrils of man and man uh, became a living soul. Uh, therefore when you understand that and you look at it and understand uh, the truth in that we understand that God is the maker. Therefore God uh, is in control. God's in control. The potter's in control and it's not the clay. Therefore we can easily conclude from the text that God is the one who's in control and in not man. Man may think he's in control. Man may think he has some a say in the matter, but in reality, a man really don't have no say at all. I mean, friend, you may, and I know how it is, I mean, you get your little job, you get your little title, you get your little money in the bank, and you think you've become somebody, but may I remind you tonight of the authority that you have is all the authority that God has allowed allowed you to have. Uh, the only reason you have what you have is because God has blessed you with it and give you with it. Hey, matter of fact, uh, the reason you woke up this morning, not because you chose to woke up, uh, you woke up because God woke you up. Uh, the reason you're still breathing, hey, uh, there's air flowing through your lungs tonight and blood still pumping in your veins. It's not because you got a say in the matter. It's not because you chose it. It's because there's a good God in heaven uh, that's gracious watching over you and protecting you and providing for you. Oh, really? We don't have a lot of say. The potter is the one in control, not the clay. God is the maker. He's the one uh, that's in control. And so we find that the potter uh, is the one in control, not the clay. We also can understand uh, very easily from the text uh, that not only is God in control, but he is a God of second chances. Him, I mean, y'all better hook up right there. That's the good part, all right? <laughs> The reality of the matter, notice what it says. He had a vessel there. Uh, this thing's marred. This thing's messed up. Uh, this thing is uh, broken down. Uh, but yet instead of throwing the vessel away and throwing the clay away, uh, the Bible says that that potter, he takes that clay, he takes that vessel, and he puts it back on the wheel, and he begins to mold it and to mend it uh, back into a vessel. Uh, and that of honor, that uh, uh, a vessel, it says, that was pleasing unto the Father. And I don't know about anybody else in here tonight, but I sure am glad we serve a God of second chances. Had it not been for a second chance, you and I wouldn't even be in here tonight. Not only just a second chance, but for some of us, it would be a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and an eighth and a ninth. And I mean that number can get really, really high. I'm glad that he's a God that don't just throw you off in the ditch somewhere when you miss up, but rather he's a God that'll forgive you uh, that'll heal you. Uh, that'll mold you and make you uh, back into a vessel of honor. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Amen. You may have walked up in here tonight and you think, preacher, you don't know my story. Uh, you don't know what I've been through. Uh, you don't know some of the mistakes I've made, uh, some of the bad choices I've made. Uh, you're exactly right. I, I don't know. Uh, but I come to tell you tonight, although your family may have thrown you away, although your friends may have thrown you away, uh, God helps sometimes, although the old brother have thrown you away. Uh, there's a God in heaven uh, that's give you another opportunity. And uh, you're not here just by chance, uh, but you're here.
here because there's a potter wanting to do a work on his will. He's wanting to mold you and to make you into a vessel of honor again. Oh, and he can, friend. He has the power. He is a God of second chances. He's a God in control. He's a God of second chances. And there's many other things and many other uh, truths and lessons that we can learn uh, here from the text. But what I'm most interested in this evening uh, is what we learn from the process of the potter molding the clay. I did some study on pottery and I read a bunch of material, watched a bunch of videos and uh, learned a bunch of stuff and uh, stuff I probably don't need to know and some stuff that really, really helped me. Uh, but I was uh, uh, learning about this, this process of how a potter molds the clay and uh, how that process is done and how they do it nowadays versus how they uh, used to do it and many other things. And what I found out is there's many different ways of how a potter molds the clay. I mean, you, you, you can do some research, you'll find that what works good for one potter might not work good for this one. There's all kinds of different techniques. There's all kinds of different mechanics. There's all kinds of different ways. I watched this one old boy, and he was adamant about it. He said, well, uh, the correct way as to how to do it, he said you would have to hold your hands at uh, 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock and lock your elbow into your side, and that's the way uh, that it worked best for him. And then you watch another potter, and he said, no, uh, hold your hands this way and a uh, different way. And some say add water uh, sooner than others, and uh, and so I walked away understanding there's many different ways and there's many different techniques. However, what I did find uh, that they all had in common as to all these different ways, all these different techniques, uh, there was one thing that stood out to me uh, because regardless of where uh, they held their hands, regardless of how uh, they added the water, regardless of how they did all of that stuff, one thing they had in common uh, was that uh, if you're going to get in pottery, uh, regardless Regardless of what you're making, regardless of the technique you use, there's one thing you are going to have to learn. You're going to have to master it if you're ever going to be able to mold clay. Here's what it was. You're going to have to learn how to center the clay. Centering the clay is when they would take that clay and they would throw it or place it in the very center of the potter's wheel. And you would take it, they, and most any good potter would tell you and that that is the most important thing that you'll learn to do. And not only is it more, one of the most important things you'll learn to do, but it's also one of the hardest things you'll learn to do. Because when you think it's in the center, just because it looks in the center, don't mean it is in the center. I'm going somewhere with this. Just hang on, all right? Just because it looks like it's in the center don't mean that it is. The only way you can tell that the clay is in the center of the wheel is when that wheel starts turning and when the forces from the outside begin to try to pull of that clay uh, to the outside, the only way that the clay will stay in the center of the wheel is if it is in the center of the wheel. If it's out just a little bit, uh, there will be an unbalance within it. Uh, it will begin to wobble. It will begin to move. And ultimately, it will begin to be pulled off to the outside of the wheel completely far falling off the wheel. If you try to mold clay and that clay is not center in that wheel, uh, there's going to be deformities in that vessel. You're going to have uneven walls. It's very, very hard uh, to make the walls completely even and uh, completely flawless uh, without that clay being in the center of the wheel. Now, here's what I want you to see. I'll give you this thought and I'll be done. But here's what I want you to see. When you look around today, it is very hard to find vessels of honor. By that I mean it's very hard to find people that love the Lord, that's serving the Lord, that's being faithful to the house of God, the things, I mean, that's hard to find. That's why I love coming up here because, I mean, friend, I love seeing families come to the house of God together. I love seeing a mama and a daddy and the boys and girls in the house of God together. But may I say that's a rarity in our day. I mean, most families, they can't even live together, much less go to church together. Amen. It's hard to find.
find a vessel of honor. It's hard to find young people that will still serve the Lord and not go with the majority nowadays and not go with the ways of Hollywood and the ways of their classmates. It's hard to find young people that will be like a Daniel we talked about this morning and stand firm in a foreign land and love God. I mean, it's hard to find that. You say, preacher, what is the problem? Why is it becoming more and more hard? Why is it becoming more and more of a rarity in our day? Well, number one, the problem's not with the potter. Amen. The problem's not with the potter. The problem is with the clay. The only explanation there is is that that clay, it is not in the center of the wheel and that of the potter. You know what the problem with today is? We got too many wobbly Christians. We got too many unbalanced Christians. We got too many Christians. I mean, they're here one day and gone the next. I mean, they're up today and down tomorrow. I call them halfway Christians. I mean, they got halfway in with God, yet they're halfway out in the world. I mean, they got one foot in the house of God and one foot on the outside of the house of God. I mean, they're on fire for a week or two and then you don't see them for a month or so. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're in and they're out. They're wibble wobbly. I mean, they're, uh, they're, they're off balance. They're, uh, they're out, of, uh, out of banks, if you will. Uh, they'll be here and then they're gone. I want to say to you that you say, what's the problem? I'll tell you what it is. They're not in the center of the wheel. Uh, they're continually getting pulled back and they're continually getting pulled uh, off the potter's wheel. And I want to say to you to this, this evening, friend, uh, you better recognize that there is a pull, there is a force from the evil of this world uh, to try to pull you out of the house of God, uh, try to pull you away from the word of God, uh, try to pull you uh, away from the, uh, the people of God. I'm telling you, friend, there is a force to try to pull you away. I've seen people let all kinds of things pull them away. I've seen people get pulled away because of their job. I've seen people get pulled away because of their hobbies. I've seen people get pulled away because of their families and because of their friends. You know what we need today? We need some people that arise up and take their stand and say, you know what? By the good grace of God, I'm not just going to go part of the way. I'm going to go all the way with God. Though none come may go with me, I still will follow him. I'm not just going to go halfway, part of the way, three quarters of the way, but I'm going to go all all the way for the glory of God. Some people that are sold out to God. Regardless of how hard the things of this world pull them away, they've made up their mind. They're going to follow the Lord. And they're going to honor God. Three things I see about this clay, and I'll give them to you and I'll be, I'll be done. Three things real quickly about this clay. If you want to stay in the center, though, if you want to get in the center of the potter's wheel and stay in the center of the potter's wheel, you better take notice to these th three things. Number one, I see the obedience of the clay. The obedience of the clay. Understand that if the clay is going to get in the center of the wheel, it can't get there on its own. The only way that the clay will get into the center of the wheel, the centermost part of the potter's wheel, the only way that's going to happen is if it allows the potter to move it and to place it into the center of that wheel. Get this now. You'll never find or get into the center of the will of God for your life if you're not willing to let God lead you and obey his leadership in your life. You may say you want in the center of the wheel, but if you're not willing to let God lead you, and if you're not willing to let God guide you, then you will never find the center of the wheel. Amen. Don't tell me you want to live in the center of the will of God, yet you ain't faithful to the house of God. Amen. Hey, man, it's preaching time now. <laughs> we'll just sink her down right there for a minute if we, if we need be. Don't tell me you're going to live for God and you want to find the center of the will of God. You ain't even faithful to read your Bible. You're not even faithful to pray. I mean, you're not even... Uh, don't tell me you want to find the center of the will of God and yet you come in here on Sunday and you shed your crocodile tears and you say, oh, how I love Jesus. And yet by Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday, you're cussing like the world, talking like the world, acting like the world. You ain't hey, friend. You're never going to find his will until you first let... Let him lead you and guide you and obey his leadership in your life. There must be an obedience of the clay. There must be a submission on behalf of the clay to allow the potter to mold it and to guide it and to place it into the center of the wheel. 
I watched this one video of this guy. He was molding this clay. And he had his hands. I can't remember how he held his hands, but he held his hands a certain way. And here's what he said. I never will forget it. He said, don't ever move your hands to accommodate the clay. But you hold your hands where they're supposed to be and you let that clay form to your hands. And that's how you get it in the center and that's how you start your, your molding and the raising of the walls and things of that nature. And that stuck out to me. You know what a lot of our problems is? We're trying to move the hands of God to accommodate our life right. so that we can get where we want to get. But it don't work that way, friend. If you ever go find the center of the will of God, you're going to have to just, just submit all unto them and, and quit trying to move the hands of God and you're going to have to move to the hands of God. Vast difference. Oh, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to fully submit and just let God have total control. Do what you will, Lord. Uh, what, 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 what the apostle Paul, hear am I, Lord. <laughs> What would you have me to do? That's a submission. That's the obedience. That's the letting the potter lead. Secondly, not only do I see there was an obedience with the clay, but I also see there was a desire to please the potter. May I say to you tonight, God wants to do a work in your life. Not just in your neighbor's life, not just in your preacher's life, but God wants to do a work in your life. The potter is not called a potter just because that's his title. You study about a potter and you'll find a potter is a potter because that's his passion. I mean, that's who he is. That's what satisfies him. That's what, uh, that's what makes him happy. That's what uh, completes him. And, and for many, uh, the reason that you're not in the center of the will of God is you really don't have a desire to please the potter. See, it goes something like this. Somebody could come to church and you could tell that God's hand is all over them and, and you can see, I, I, I'll give you an instance in, in my life. Y'all don't know me up here and that's, that's a good thing. Say amen right there. So you can't, you can't even bring all this stuff up. But there's some places I go and even to this day there's some mamas that say, I can't believe you're a preacher. <laughs> I remember you when you was a teenager. I remember you when you was in middle school. You was mean. Am I lying? <laughs> We've walked into some churches and they're like, you're doing the preaching? But I've also had this happen. My, 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 I can't believe what God's done in your life. I see your family, I see your ministry, and I see all this. And I'm not, listen, I'm not bragging on me because it ain't got nothing to do with me. But they'll look, I mean, it's like this. You go down to the storehouse and you see a wonderful vessel, a vessel of honor, something that's attractive sitting there on the shelf. Hey, yeah, you may look at it and say, what a beautiful piece of pottery. Oh, what a beautiful vessel that is. But you know what the next question is going to be? Who was it that made that thing? I mean, who was it? What was his name? I want to get, I know, I want to get to know him. Uh, here's what I'm trying to say. Uh, you ought to desire to want to be a vessel uh, that God molds and makes into whatever he wants to make. Uh, not so it satisfies you, but so that when you walk down the street and others walk by you and they see your life and they see your family and they see what God did in your heart and in your life and how he changed you, they don't look at you and say, my, what a good preacher that boy is. Uh, my, what a good singer they are. Uh, my, what a this and a what a that. But may they look at you and say my oh, what a good God in heaven that can take something that bad and make something that good out of it oh what a God he is that's the desire of the Christian hey if we ever get to the place where we want the world to look at us and that think that we are something then we've missed it friend we are what we are by the grace of God. They ought to look at us and say, my, what a God, what a maker, what, what, what wonderful God he is that can take something that helpless and that hopeless and make something of value out of that. Oh, that's the mark, friend. There must be a desire to want to please the potter. That's what satisfies the potter. You know what the, you know what would make the potter happy tonight? If he could take your life, if you would allow him to take your life and to mold it into whatever he's wanting to do. That's what would satisfy the potter. That's his passion. That's what uh, uh, satisfies him. There must be a desire to want to please him. Lastly, and I'm done. I see not only was there an obedience from the clay, a desire to want to please the potter, but there must be a tiredness 
of living in a marred condition. I mean, you're never going to find the will of God. You're never going to find the center of the will of God. You're never going to submit all and just let God mold you and make you into what he wants to be until you first become tired of living in the marred condition that you're living in. Can I ask you tonight, aren't you tired of living on, outside, on the outside of the wheel? I mean, aren't you tired of living an unbalanced life? Aren't you tired of being muck and mire and just not knowing where you're going, being pulled every which direction? Aren't you tired of living in that broken condition? Aren't you tired of living there? I mean, until you get to the place of being tired about it, friend, you're never going to find it. You know why I got saved? I was tired of living in fear. I was tired... Of, of living in the condition. I was tired of the rottenness and, the, and, and I don't know how it was with you, but man, I just felt dirty. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, I felt worthless. I felt dirty. I remember the night I got saved and the Holy Ghost was speaking to my heart. I done rejected him time and time again. And yet he gave me another opportunity, preacher. And I remember that night and I thought within myself, I'm just so dirty and I'm just so bad and I'm just so rotten. And it was that tiredness of being there at that point me in the direction of one that could take, uh, take somebody uh, in that condition and change them throughout all eternity. Amen. Are you tired of living like that? Hey, mama. Hey, daddy. Are you tired of getting home from work and it's nothing but yelling and screaming? Hey, young person, aren't you tired of coming to church with mom and daddy on a Sunday and just feeling awful because of what you've been doing on Saturday night? Aren't you tired of living in that condition? And then you look over there and you say, man, I wish I had it together like so-and-so. I wish I was like brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. They got it all together. No, they ain't got it all together. All they're doing is submitting to the potter and the potter's doing the work. They don't even know what to do. They just follow his leadership. How do you get there? You just let God lead you. I'll leave you with this. I was doing some studying and found about this potter back in, in the ancient times. They say that pottery, that was a, a common trade, but it was not a popular trade. People didn't like it. It was, by the way, a potter. He was not dressed up. I mean, he was dirty. When you've seen somebody, I mean, he, 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 he looked like he was molding clay. He looked like it and, uh, because he'd been digging in the clay. And he, and, by the way, aren't you glad that uh, the great potter reached down one day into the muck and the mire and uh, grabbed, uh, picked the clay up out of the ground? Amen. Uh, but I found that uh, back then is they, they didn't like it done in the city, and so they would make the potter go outside of the town and and he would have to uh, do his trade out there. Uh, in other words, he would have to go outside uh, of the safety of the city in order to uh, carry out his trade, in order to uh, fulfill what satisfies him, and that being molding vessels uh, into what pleased him. And here's what spoke to my heart. Uh, here's what I want you to see tonight. Uh, may I say, uh, there was the great part of the Lord Jesus himself. And may I say, he left that world and he came to this world. Uh, not because he just wanted to get away, not because he just needed, uh, you know, to uh, take a vacation. No, 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 no. He came to this world uh, because he loves the clay. He desires the clay. He wants to do a work in the clay's life. And he left that world, came to this world. May I say, it was a great sacrifice that he would leave that world and come to this world. Uh, do you recognize that he sat on the throne of heaven and they recognized him as the king that he was? Uh, yet he would leave that world and come to this world uh, to where uh, they would curse him and condemn him to die. I mean, he left a world where there was no sin, there was no heartache, there was no sh uh, shame, uh, there was no broken hearts, uh, there was no tears, and he would come to a world filled with sin, shame, uh, sorrow, and broken heart. Why? Because he desires to do a work. Uh, and that in the clay's life. And I'm just simply saying, I don't know who you are, uh, but I know there's a good God in heaven that loves you with a love uh, beyond your comprehension. And his desire is to do a work in your life. He can save you tonight. He can forgive you tonight. He can change you tonight. Uh, my God has the power uh, to put broken things back together. He can put your marriage back together. He can put your home back together. I'm telling you, friend, there's nothing uh, too hard for our God. Amen.
But you got to get tired of living where you're living. Amen. You got to get tired of the consequences of sin. The life of sin. Living in that broken, dirty condition. And just say, here, here am I, Lord. I'm yours. Oh, the greatest day of my life is when I submitted to him. And he took over. Preachers, uh, people say, preacher, how, how did you get from where you was to where you are now? Here's how. Here am I, Lord. I don't know nothing, but I know you are who you say you are. And I believe it with every fiber of my being. And I'm not much, and I don't claim to be much, and I'm nothing, and you don't even need me. But I know you love me. Here I am, Lord. Take my life and use it how it please you. And you watch God do a work Amen. that you couldn't even do yourself. I mean, you're struggling and fighting. You're trying to be somebody. That's what I don't understand. All these men I hear, they work all these long hours. They're doing this, doing that, trying to accomplish something. Why don't you just let God have your life? He'll accomplish way more in one week than you will in a lifetime. Amen. Amen. The potter and the clay. What about you tonight? Are you ready? Are you willing to let God have total control in that of your life? He can do it. He can change you. He can do a work that only he can do. The greatest life ever is the life in the center of the potter's wheel. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. Lord, I thank you for thy word. Thank you, Lord, for how you stirred within my heart. Thank you for the work that you've done in my life. And the work you continue to do. Lord, I know you desire to do a work in these people's life tonight. And I pray for that one, Lord. They're, they're back there on the edge. They'd like to be in the center of that wheel. They would all like to be molded and mended by the hands of the potter, but yet they're still not willing to let go. I pray tonight be the night that they would come willfully, submit all unto thee, and say, here am I, Lord. Do what you will with me. If there's one here tonight that's not saved, I pray they'd come get saved for it's everlasting too late. We love you, and we thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' high and holy name, I do humbly pray. Amen and amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to sing. If God spoke to your heart, I invite you to come tonight.